What's up friends? Welcome to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Kim and today do I have a case for you. Today we're going to be talking about Dennis Bauman. Dennis Bauman was, is a convicted murderer and a serial sex offender. Dennis in the last year or the last two years has been convicted of a 40 year old murder as well is scheduled to go to trial for a 30 year old murder of his adopted daughter that he ended up confessing to his wife. <laughs> case for me hits home because this is my hometown. This is where I lived. Michigan is where I'm from. This man lived in Hamilton, which is right outside of Holland, and some of his crimes were done in Holland. It's crazy. You get in this bubble when you're in a, a community that's not like LA where I'm at now, where there's just crime everywhere, that things like this just don't happen where I came from. It's super safe, it's super quiet, there's never anything to do, that type of thing. When then you find out it's a lot of crime that happened and there is some crime that happened right in my little bubble. And so I was super surprised to find this case and although it's not 100% completed yet, I think I have enough information and I just wanna share this, especially with my Holland friends because raising awareness of your surroundings, cause you get this false sense of security when you're in a safer community, but we still need to protect the ones that we love and hopefully by shedding some awareness that you know people will just take this into account in their in their day-to-day -day lives and just know that there's bad people people out there with bad intentions that we just have to protect our little ones we can only do what we can do but wow 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 so let's go ahead and get started let's talk about this Please share this with your fellow Holland friends just to spread awareness is all. Dennis Bauman and the tragedies and destruction that he left in his wake. Dennis was born in 1949. Dennis was part of the US Navy and then going on to be part of the Navy Reserves. A judge once sentenced him, and, and this was in his sentence in 2018, which would say, psychologists indicate that he presents the clinical picture of a rapist. And we conclude that he is a danger to women if he is not confined. And confined he is, thank God. It's just sad that it took as long as it did. Dennis would have many run-ins with the law over the years, some crimes going unsolved for up to 40 years. Dennis was married to a woman by the name of Brenda. They would go on to adopt one child, Andrea, and have their own biological child named Vanessa. Dennis and Brenda were members of the Christ Memorial Church, where Dennis was a Sunday school teacher, but later he was asked to leave the church after discovering Dennis's criminal behavior. Now we are going to go through Dennis's destruction. I'm not going to go into the order in which it was solved but rather the timeline of his crimes. I think it just makes a little bit more sense instead of jumping back and forth. So I, I don't know. There's no real good way to go through this because he went years without being charged. So let's just let's just go through chronological by year. So in 1975, the Bauman family adopted Andrea Bauman. Who is Andrea Bauman? Well, let me tell you. And how did she end up with the Bauman family? Andrea was born Alexis Miranda Badger on June 23rd, 1974 in New Orleans, Louisiana. To better understand how Andrea was put up for adoption and landed with the Bauman family, let's talk about her biological mother, Kathy Turkanian, and how she gave up her precious daughter for adoption with the hopes of a brighter future than what Kathy had had herself. Kathy from Virginia did not grow up in a healthy 
household. She described it more as dysfunctional and broken. Kathy was adopted by her mother's third husband and she described him as just not a very kind person. I'm going to link a podcast below for you guys to listen to that Kathy did. It goes into a lot more detail and it, Kathy is a huge advocate for Andrea. Love it to death. So please check that out. Kathy by the age of 14 was working in a bar and then went on to work in a traveling carnival. 14 years old. That's like what ninth grade? That's so young. Kathy at the age 15 fell in love um, and with her parents permission she went on to marry and at 16 her husband who was then 19 Kathy would become pregnant. They would go on to have their daughter who they named Alexis Miranda Badger. The marriage however did not last and Kathy was to move back with her mom in Virginia. Kathy was struggling only 17 years old no job living with her mom who was battling a fight of breast cancer and had four other children in the home. Kathy felt like she was being backed into a corner when her mom behind her back was speaking with a Christian adoption agency to seek a new home for Kathy's beautiful daughter, Alexis. Kathy wasn't even aware that her mother was doing this. Kathy felt discouraged by her mom's strong feelings uh, towards Kathy not being able to care for Alexis. Feeling the pressure, I mean, I could just imagine if somebody's telling you, you know, you're just not good enough, you start to believe it and you start doubting yourself. And maybe she felt it herself, her own insecurity and her mom just added to the fuel. Kathy made the most selfless, most heart-wrenching decision of her life to put her baby girl up for adoption. I've seen conflicting reports, but I want to say she was about 21 months old when she was finally with the Bowman family. I've seen 9 to 21 months. So Heartbroken Kathy picked up the pieces. She ended up graduating high school, married, became a registered nurse. I don't know why that makes me happy when adoptive mothers go on to do something instead of like getting addicted to drugs or you know what I mean? It's just a, hopefully it's a happy ending for both of them. She was looking for Alexis. She was hoping one day that she would meet up with Alexis again, but because they had a close adoption, it was really unlikely that that would happen. Brenda and Dennis Bauman adopted Alexis in 1975. Her name was then changed to Andrea Bauman. We are going to talk about Andrea, but let's first go through some other crimes that Dennis would do that are not so family friendly. May 23rd, 1980, while in Grand Haven, Michigan, Dennis accosted a girl riding her bike. It was 11 a.m. in the morning. She was a teenage girl. She was riding her bike on Lakeshore Drive near Kirk Park. She was on a stretch of road where she saw a motorcycle turn onto Lakeshore, heading the opposite direction, like towards her. Traffic was light that day, so when the motorcycle did like a U-turn and passed her again, she was a bit concerned, but she just pretty much carried on, you know, that was weird, but whatever. The driver of the motorcycle ends up doing another U-turn. So he's done three U-turns at this point. And as he rides towards her, she notices some distinctive features about both his appearance and the motorcycle. He passes her again, and now she's like, okay, this is really weird. What is this strange man doing? Soon she would find out. He ends up coming up behind her and then whipping his bike in front of her, stopping in front of her, which is making her stop on her bicycle. And he's yelling at her, get off your bike and head towards the woods. She is just frozen with fear. Like she's just looking at him like she's in shock. Like she can't move. He yells at her again, and this time he shows her a gun. She is still like, what is going on? In her head, she's like, if I do what he says, 
if I head to those woods, I might not make it out. So what does he do? He fires a shot that goes over her head. She knew if she did what he said, she just might not make it out. So she's still just frozen, even after the gunshot. And I'm sure she's still in shock. He starts approaching her, yelling at her even louder. She's trying to plead with him and he shoots again at her feet. He's yelling, she's pleading, but suddenly, from the grace of God, Dennis is distracted by a car that's in the distance. So the girl, the teenage girl, starts booking it. Like she is off, it's a life or death. I'm not looking behind me, I am, I'm moving it. So she can hear in the background, Dennis like trying to get his motorcycle started, but he struggles like he just cannot get this thing going and so she happens to see like she she did end up looking back because she's seen a truck and she knew this was her opportunity she gets right in the middle of the road she's waving her arms for the truck to stop and he did the truck did stop she threw her bike in the back of his truck and he drove her home where she reported it to her mom she told her mom if you this man, he's shooting at me, whatever. So the mom calls 911. So the police were there within minutes. That is the difference between LA and Holland. You have to be on hold for five minutes before you can even speak to somebody. Anyways, nevertheless, Holland uh, response time is, in my experience, has been really good. So the police were there within, within minutes. They were able to get a great description of the motorcycle and the man driving it. She knew he had glasses on, she knew he had a blue helmet, she knew that there was a wood box, uh, like a built box on the motorbike, on the motorcycle that like, you know, like a storage compartment or whatever. So these were all very distinctive features that she could point out. So Dennis was picked up not long after. It was, it's just amazing how fast everything happened, luckily. So they asked the girl and her mom to come to the police station to see if she can identify him as her attacker. And so they agree. The mom's like, heck yeah, let's go get this guy. So the police car had tinted windows because Dennis wasn't even in, in the police station at this point. I don't know if they were holding him outside so they could, you know, I don't know. It's kind of weird, but they had him outside. He was next to a police car and she was in the police car with her mom. And she looks at her mom and she's like, that's him, that's the man they had him. This was Dennis's first conviction, but it will not be his last, unfortunately. He was charged with attempted murder, because remember, he was shooting at her. This wasn't just a like an easy crime. So it was attempted murder charge. What proceeds to happen after this is just mind blowing. Dennis, he's arrested. He's charged with attempted murder. He makes bond, right? He's on bail. He's out on bond, on bail. He's out of the jail. And he asked if he could get permission to leave the state to go to Virginia. And they granted him permission. And I think the only reason they granted him that favor is because it was with the Navy, but oh, he's facing charges of attempted murder, but they let him go to Virginia. And this is when he meets Kathleen Doyle. Kathleen Doyle was only 25 years old. Her and her husband, Stephen Doyle, had only been married for less than a year. And then Stephen, her new husband, was shipped away to the Navy, the USS Eisenhower in the Indian Ocean. Kathleen was an inspiring author. She just really wanted to become an author one day. So she was starting out by maintaining a journal you know, probably journal journaling about her day and short stories and whatnot. She came from a military family, so she wasn't new to the whole being away from her husband experience because her dad had been away a lot. Uh, so when her husband would go away, it would be just her and her tabby cat. Kathleen was known to really value her friendships, especially knowing that her husband's gonna be away a lot. She really nurtured those friendships. Kathy was known to really make other people feel special and really put other people in front of herself. Just a very kind, friendly 
person. On Thursday, September 12th, 1980, at 12 p.m. in the afternoon, Kathleen's friends had not heard from her since Tuesday evening at 9.30 p.m. So just about two days, Tuesday to Thursday, they grew concerned. They, they usually hear from her, but they hadn't. So they went to her house to check on her on the 9400 block of Gamby Street in Norfolk, Virginia. What they found was devastating. They found Kathleen's lifeless body. They called the police immediately. Her apartment looked like it had been ransacked. And after the examiner completed their exam, it was confirmed that Kathleen had been sexually assaulted strangled with a cord and if that wasn't enough she was stabbed several times this was a violent attack the police were stunned and and could not identify any person who would have any problem with kathleen nevertheless to be able to do this to her so the case went cold in the meantime, Dennis returns to Michigan to face the charges for the shooting at the girl on her motorcycle. He was on his motorcycle, she was on her bike. His Again, his charges were attempted murder. Dennis pled guilty to a lesser charge of, this is a mouthful, but assault with intent to commit sexual conduct. Assault with the intent to commit criminal sexual conduct. The attempted murder charge was dropped and Dennis would be sentenced on February 1980 to five to ten years in prison. His wife Brenda Bauman, standing by her man, decides to move herself and their adopted daughter closer to the prison so she can go visit him. Uprooted her daughter from her school, her friends, her home to be closer to a monster. This is not the last time she would put her criminal husband in front of her children. It's super sad. So meantime, Dennis is in jail. In 1984, four years since Kathleen's murder, the Virginia woman who had been murdered, comes in Henry Lewis. Henry Lewis was on death row and had charges of killing his own mother and had already spent 15 years, but he was on death row at this point. He had numerous claims for had committed crimes. He's claiming he committed these crimes um, that he did not commit. He did this in my opinion and a lot of other people's opinion for special favors. He got field trips, to, you know, to the places of crime. He's out riding in a car, picking up McDonald's, smoking his cigarettes. And then in Henry's words, he did it just to piss off the police department. He confessed to the crimes he didn't do just to piss them off. He claimed he was responsible for the death of Kathleen Doyle. She was one of 600 women that he claimed he had killed that later he was discredited for. Norfolk police interviewed, investigated, and actually brought Lewis up on charges and his accomplice to later just be dropped. And Henry, of course, recanted his confession and they were back to zero. The case is now cold again and this case would not pick up traction again for decades. Dennis was released from prison in 1985-86-ish after serving his five years for assault. Dennis never made it on the sex offenders list. This is so frustrating because there was no sex offender list. So the community is none the wiser that this man has committed any crimes, that he's a predator in their neighborhood. Like, they had no idea, not his, nobody, nobody knew. The Michigan Sex Offender Registry started in 1996. Not long after Dennis got out of jail, Brenda and Dennis, of course, reunite. Brenda, all googly-eyed, loving her husband more than ever, is now pregnant with their biological daughter named Vanessa. In 1988, okay, I have to say allegedly, although I believe this happened, November 28th, 1988, Andrea accused 
then 40 year old Dennis Lee Bauman, her adopted dad, of molesting her. Andrea was able to get the attention of a principal at school who involved CPS, who then as well was able to involve the police department. These are big claims. So a social worker from CPS Child Protective Services and a police officer go out to investigate the allegations. The Baumans, of course, you know, what are they gonna do? Yeah, we did it? No, they denied it. Of course they're gonna deny it. And so they told the CPS worker that she was just acting out because she had recently found out that she was adopted. The CPS worker asked Andrea if she wanted to leave the house, but Andrea, Oh, she does sign, sound so kind. Didn't want to leave her baby sister behind. Her baby sister would have been about one, so she declined and the CPS worker was satisfied with this. I'm led to believe that they didn't do any checking on the family, criminal record, I guess they wouldn't. And so they were said that they gave Andrea uh, some counseling through Bethany Christian Services and she never mentioned the allegations again. I can only imagine that it got worse for Andrea though, is why she didn't do anything further about it. No further investigation was done that I could find, but only four months later, after these allegations, Andrea was reported missing. March 11th, 1989, Dennis reports to the police that their adoptive daughter, Andrea, was a runaway. Dennis claimed that she stole some of Dennis's money and was running away to find her biological mother. The cops believing Dennis's story that she was indeed a runaway allegedly didn't really do much or put much effort into her missing persons case. Andrea's case was classified as an endangered runaway. Remember, Dennis had served five years in prison already for, for charges, so why more investigation didn't happen at that time is just puzzling to me. They didn't do a search, they did nothing. What is so strange and infuriates me to the core is in the following months, Andrea's adopted mother, Brenda Bauman, made several calls to the police department in which she stated she had told by her friends that they saw Andrea, that they, but they were never substantiated. Brenda would give names of people who said they seen her, but when the police investigated, they said they had never seen her. This is how I see this happening. Brenda calling the police. Yeah, this is Brenda. My friend Susie said she seen Andre at the grocery store. Her hair was blonde and she was visibly pregnant. But she did this several times and she did different stories. Why wasn't the, her friend calling? None of these people ever came forward because she was making them up. Okay, so the next case I'm gonna talk about, Dennis has not been charged with this case, okay? But I'm gonna put up a composite sketch. You look at the sketch, I'm gonna tell the story, you can find the similarities, and then let's talk about it. In September 1989, just a few months after Andrea is reported missing, a six-year-old girl was abducted. She was abducted only blocks from Dennis's home in where he worked. She was walking down 160th Avenue, crossing on 32nd Street, close to the Windmill Gas Station in Holland, Michigan, when a white male in a red pickup truck asked her if she wanted to see some puppies. She got closer, and then the man snatched her and put her in the truck. This happened at 3 p.m. in the afternoon, broad daylight, and nobody seen a thing. Now remember, the girl on the bike she was attacked at 11 a.m., broad daylight. He takes her to what cops later think is Silver Creek Park in Hamilton. The abductor takes the six-year-old girl into the woods, forces her to undress. He ties her up, blindfolds her, and she hears the worst sound I'm sure she's ever heard, and that's his zipper pulling down. For whatever reason, this man got spooked and he ran. 
Luckily, he left six-year-old scared alone in the woods. She was able to untie the rope herself and she ran into the street where she was spotted and picked up and taken to the police station. When asked about her attack and what she remembers, it's just eerie. She remembers rough, dirty hands, stroking her cheek, putting my hair behind my ear, the sounds of a zipper and dogs barking. So it's believed that she heard he heard the dogs and it spooked him and he ran. Thank God. Look at the composite sketch again. Leave your comments down below. Do you think this is the same man? In 1990-ish, shortly after this incident, the Baumans up and moved. They relocated to the rural area, to a rural area in Hamilton, Michigan. Dennis went silent for years, as far as what we know today. It wasn't until the fall 1997, in the winter 1988, he would seek out his next prey, Vicki Vandenbreek. Vicki lived only a mile away from where Dennis lived. Dennis worked at an assembly line at a local factory. His coworkers coined him the nickname Hack and Scratch. This is because he would always hack loogies and scratch his crotch. Super classy, scumbag. Vicky was not attracted to Dennis, thought of him as the old nasty guy she worked with, but Dennis, now he was fascinated with her. He then proceeds to break into her home when she's not there, stealing her lingerie, cutting her blinds at the lower section so he could see in. Breaking doors is just to name a few. He did this about twice a week for two months. Vicky goes to the police and the police and her just could not figure out who was doing this. So the police end up setting up a silent alarm to go off when it's tripped. And one day it did. The police were dispatched and guess who it was? Good old hack and scratch, Dennis Bauman. The police asked Dennis why he was there in the house uninvited. Dennis tells the police, this is a good one. Oh my God, this is so good. I was walking by and had a serious case of diarrhea. He saw the house and let himself in. Bathroom is all I was trying to do is use the bathroom. The police department was able to search Dennis's house and what did they find? They found three pry bars, lace underwear, a case for binoculars, a black mask, and a short barrel shotgun. What the heck? Anybody else highly concerned? Vicky really thinks she was the next victim, and I have to agree with her. Dennis was convicted of breaking and entering, but before sentencing, Dennis had several references mailed to the court on his behalf. He was a hard worker. They were stating he needed to be with his family. He was a good man. These references were from his church, his boss, they obviously didn't know him, and I'm sure they had major regrets. The church did later ban him and his family from the church, but at this point, he's the good guy. These letters stated about Dennis that he was a Sunday school teacher, as well as a member of the PTO of the elementary school. How creepy is that? He goes on to explain the in a letter that he wrote the judge that he's a father of two lovely daughters. One's 25, one's 11. He fails to tell them that the 24, the 25 year old, he hasn't spoken to in 11 years. She's been missing for 11 years. And <laughs> it must have just slipped his mind. And the wife, Brenda, comes forward and says, he's working with the church. You know, he didn't have a good upbringing, so he's working through it now. Everybody gave him a reference, his wife, his counselor, his bosses. They all just asked him not to get jail time. But despite this, I don't think it's enough time, but he did get one year in jail and he had to pay for the repairs for Vicky's home. I'm sure Vicky to this day does not sleep well. She never knew that it was even him. Like he wasn't even on her radar. She remembers that him and his daughter came to her house one time to sell Girl Scout cookies, but, but that was the only time. And wow, crazy. 
I could not imagine. I could not imagine. So in 1999, a Jane Doe discovered in the Wisconsin cornfield, later determined to be Peggy Johnson. But they were suspected that potentially this could be Andrea due to the noticeable resemblance. However, Andrea was ruled out as it wasn't possible because of the DNA profile that the biological mother, Kathy, had submitted. You see, Kathy got a notice in the mail from the adoption agency. She was super excited when they she got. Kathy was hoping for this day for so long. I mean, nervous, exciting, you know. She, it was just pouring out of her, thinking this was the day. She's been waiting for the possibility that she would meet up with her daughter, Andrea slash Alexis and get a chance to get to know her. Well, this was all diminished when they told Kathy that her daughter had been missing for 10 years and they needed a DNA sample from Kathy. I cannot imagine the pain Kathy was going through at that moment. Even to be hit again when she asked her name and where she lived, they could not give her any information because it had been a closed adoption. Hopeless Kathy prized to get as much information as she can get at this point, and the social worker was able to tell her that her daughter lived in Michigan and her adopted father had a criminal history. She continued to say that he may have something to do with her disappearance. Kathy and her now husband got to work and was able to find out exactly who she was and her name was Andrea Bauman. Kathy was on a mission looking into Dennis, the adopted dad. She was shocked to see how extensive his rap she had grown. She at this point was convinced he had something to do with it. Dennis released again from jail because he spent the year in jail because of Vicky and he went silent again, at least as far as we know. But this all changed in 2018. Remember Kathy Doyle from 1980? Well, in 2018, the Norfolk Police Department took another look at Kathleen's case. With new developments in genealogy and DNA, they took a shot in the dark to see if they could find a match. A DNA sample was collected from Kathleen's bedspread. And from this, they created a gene pool that was central to come from Michigan. So the Norfolk department gets with the Michigan department to narrow the search down. They were able to get an exact match from the Michigan criminal database. This is an exact match to Dennis Lee Bauman, now 70 years old. This case had gone on for 40 years. I cannot believe it. And that's when I hear states that don't have a cold case department. It just breaks, or not states, but cities. It just breaks my heart because our genealogy and our DNA has grown so much. They're solving so many crimes. It's just amazing. Dennis was now faced with the charges of the brutal death of Kathleen Doyle. Dennis soon after confesses the charges that he had committed to Kathleen. He was only 31 years old when he did these claims. He's now 70 and he, he admits that he did it. And this is what Dennis claims. He claims he was extremely intoxicated. He broke into her apartment and from an open bedroom window, he was able to break in but he was only breaking in to steal. He wasn't there to hurt her. Kathleen just happened to be there. He stated that when he left the house, she was still alive. Like, that's not my fault, she was still alive. Not sure what difference that makes, but he just wanted to make that clear. But he didn't call the cops after he left either, so he pleaded guilty and in June 2020, he was sentenced to two life sentences plus 20 years. I mean, he's 70 years old at this, t this time, but it was well-deserved. The cops are now looking into Dennis a bit deeper and discovered that Dennis had an adopted daughter and her name was Andrea Bauman that had suspiciously gone missing in 1989. So the police questioned Dennis about Andrea. In the Allegan County courtroom, Brenda, the wife, Brenda Bauman, took the stand to testify 
about her husband's confession to murdering their daughter. I'll show you a clip of this, but I did see on Andrea's Facebook page that the biological mother said he admitted it, and but she says that's not true and the truth will come out in trial. But Dennis is known for pleading guilty to take lesser charges, and he's already gonna die in jail at this point. So I think he's gonna make a deal just to not go to trial to get Brenda off, just by pleading guilty. This being said, Dennis states that he killed her on accident. Dennis claims that they were fighting at the top of the stairs when Dennis ends up slapping her and she fell from the top of the stairs and broke her neck and then died. He didn't call the police, but rather he, he dismembered her body, put her in garbage bags and put her out to the road, but then has a change of heart and buries her in the backyard. It's sick, it's disgusting. This man is terrible, he's evil. Remember how they moved houses right after that? what happened with the six-year-old that we don't know is him, but Andre went missing? Well, they ended up moving, right? He moved her body to the new house on 136th Avenue in Hamilton, Michigan. At least that's the story he told. He actually unburied her and moved her over there. And Andrea was discovered in a shallow grave under a thin cement block. The remains had been dismembered and placed into several trash bags and the trash bags had just regular garbage in it as well. May 2020, Dennis has several new charges. I mean, these charges are coming against him and he got open murder, felony murder, first degree child abuse, mutilation of a body, and they were all for Andrea Bauman after 30 years. Brenda is not implicated at this point. Here's the testimony and let's talk about it. First today, the wife of a man accused of killing their adopted daughter more than 30 years ago now says he admitted to the murder and even helped lead investigators to her remains. Dennis Bowman's wife took the stand during his preliminary hearing in Allegan County today. Our Julie Dunmire joins us in the newsroom with more on what was said in court. Julie. Doug and Annie, Dennis Bowman long suspected of killing his 14-year-old adopted daughter Andrea, but today in court, we heard testimony from his wife that he even admitted to doing it. I have confessed to the death of my daughter, Andrea, by myself and no one else. A written confession from the hands of Dennis Bowman 30 years after his teenage daughter disappeared. At some point when Andrea was approximately 13 to 14 years old, do you recall her making a disclosure about abuse by the defendant? Yes. Was that sexual abuse? She told me one morning that dad had molested her. And I looked at her and I told her, nice, and that's a lie and you know it. That's the voice of Brenda, Dennis Bowman's wife. She says after that claim, they took Andrea to a counselor at Bethany Christian and that she recanted the story. But less than a year later, Andrea disappeared. Bowman showing up at his wife's work to tell her she'd run away. What did he say to you when he came? He said that Andrea had run away. She had taken money out of the baby's bedroom and she had taken the income tax money off his dresser and took her duffel bag and she was gone. For 30 years, she was listed as a missing person, but Andrea hadn't run away. When you got off work that night then at 11 p.m., did you look for Andrea? I don't think so. It wasn't until 2019 when Bowman was arrested for a separate murder in Virginia in 1980 that his wife says he revealed he'd known where Andrea was all along. He had a meeting at the jail and he basically told me that Andrea was dead and it was his fault. Following up that meeting with the confession letter that Brenda says was meant to help her break the news to their families in a later phone call from jail. He was talking something about so near, so far, right under your nose. And I says, what the hell are you talking about? And he goes, Andrea, she's buried in the backyard. And I said, no, she's not. We didn't even live here then. And he says, well, I moved her from the other house as soon as we signed papers on the land. 
Brenda was unsure if he was telling the truth. She felt there had been so many lies already. But investigators started digging the next day, finding Andrea's remains buried in trash bags. And after I stood over the spot for a few minutes, I turned and I was going to walk back and Todd walked me back to the house. And all I could say to him is he didn't lie to me this time. He didn't lie, Todd. Some points that I find are interesting about that interview is the part where she said she told me one morning that dad had molested her and I looked at her and I told her that's a lie and you know it. Brenda, hey Brenda. He pled guilty to a charge of assault with the intent to commit criminal sexual conduct. Why wouldn't he do it? Do I don't need to remind you, Brenda. You see, because she resided with him. She was married to him for 50 years. I'm sure she gained a few secrets in those years. You cannot tell me she had no idea. There's just no way. There's no way. And she made those calls to say she'd seen Andrea? I don't think so. And then the fact that they go on to say, when you got home and knew that she had gone missing, did you go and try to find her? And she says, hmm, no, I don't think so. I can't believe it. I don't think she did anything. I honestly just don't think she cared. I think Andrea was a present to her sick, disgusting husband. Like the Ken and Barbie case, the sister, in my opinion, she is just the worst. Her husband is getting allegation after allegation and she is not protecting the community, never mind her own children. In my opinion, allegedly. My final thoughts, Brenda should be held responsible. Maybe it's possible that she didn't know about Andrea's death, but when she was missing, she was glad she was gone. I mean, she was making those calls. She was sick of her husband, in my opinion, showing Andrea more attention than her. It's a possibility. We're just talking here. I have no idea. Why would Dennis confess to Andrea? This is my thought. Kathy is, is a renegade, right? She, Kathy is the biological mother of Andrea. She is not stopping. She has a Facebook page, which I will link below that you need to see. She is who you want by your side. You don't want to mess with her family, okay? And she is not letting go. She is on a mission. So Kathy's out here and she's saying all along, check Dennis's house. Check the house. Dennis knows she's not going to stop. And so he's already been charged with murder. And he knows that they're going to come knocking at that door. And he's in jail, so he can't move the body. He doesn't want Brenda to go down for the murder, so he confesses. And I bet a million Monopoly dollars he is going to plead guilty and not have a trial. As long as there's no charges against Brenda, I am convinced that that's the plea deal he's going to make. And I think that the state will take him up on that offer. I, I don't know this for sure. This is just my opinion. I have no idea. He has nothing to lose at this point. He is in jail for the rest of his life. He's, he's now 72, so at this point, he's, at best, he's got 10 years. I think, well, he could have longer, but I, I'm, he doesn't look well. <laughs> so I don't think that he's going to, uh, anyways, that's beside the point. I just really think that he, it, it won't actually go to trial. But I do hope that he gets like some kind of a shred of consciousness that he admits that he's committed other crimes if he has committed other crimes. Now, I don't know that he's committed any other crimes, but if he has, if he'll confess to them because the cops will never know. If there's no DNA evidence, then at this point they will go unsolved. But if, if he could give the family's closure, because I have to believe those times that he went dormant as far as being caught, I feel like he was doing something, but we just don't know what that is. To this date, he is not on the sex offenders list. Even after the breaking and entering, he was not added to the sex offender list because it wasn't, it was breaking and entering. There was a sexual motive there, you could tell by stealing the undergarments, but that wasn't the charge. So 
That's scary to me. That is so scary, but it is what it is. I mean, the, it's in place now. And so, yeah. Neighbors said he was super creepy, that they kind of kept to themselves. And I, this case isn't completely over. I'm really curious to see what happens with the trial of Andrea. And like I said, Kathy, I give her so much love. You are an angel. Thank you for all your work. If nobody tells you, which you're going to do it anyways, and you don't need my thanks, but you are really advocating for Andrea and her memory where her family, her adopted parents did not. Her sister didn't even know she had a sister. There was no pictures. There was no legacy. There's no finding out where she is. It was just bleep. She's gone. How does one not know they had a sister who ran away, could be potentially alive, and they don't mention it to her? It makes sense for Dennis to do that, but it doesn't make sense for Brenda to do that. Because Brenda's claiming she didn't know she ran away. Why wouldn't she mention that to her daughter? Her daughter is clueless. Dennis, one time, this is allegedly, Dennis, uh, or not one time, but Dennis would go to Vanessa, his, his biological daughter's college, her dorm, and he would hang out. It got to the point where everybody was so sketched out by him that the campus security had to ask him to not return. That is so crazy, creepy. Ugh, this man is awful. Watch your kids, guys. Just remember this case and know that even though you're in you could live in a safe area there is still bad people out there you can only do what you can do i understand that if there's anything i want to do in this video is just raise awareness thank you so much for watching i love you guys to death and i'll see you in my next one thanks so much for watching bye